Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Joel Jackson, who's the president and co-founder of LifeForce. Hey, Joel. Hey, Phil. Great to be here with you. Oh, great. Uh, Joel, I mean, obviously, you guys are doing some great things out there. We've, you, know, see, we, you support us on our website, which is great. We see uh, a lot of traffic coming through uh, and interest in what you guys are doing. And um, interestingly, our demographic on our website is across the board, right? Um, but I'm in my 50s. Uh, you look like you're in your 40s. And I, I guess I'd be really interested to know is, uh, you know, how do you feel that um, uh, with life expectancy increasing, how really focusing on age proactively is something that we should all be thinking about these days? Yeah, so I, I think it's interesting to talk about why we've increased life expectancy over the last, say, 50 or 60 years. And we've been really good at it, right? Like, we've been remarkably good at increasing lifespan. We've increased lifespan in the United States by like seven or eight years since 1960. We went from like 2,000 centenarians to like 90,000 centenarians. We'll have millions of centenarians here soon. But, but what it, what's really driven that is us getting pretty good at fixing things that break. And, and that's really all, all that's changed so far. Um, and I mean, you know, you, you run a company called Longevity Technology, so I think you're probably aligned in believing, like I do, that there's going to be magic that comes here in the next, say, 10 to 20 years, that, that's not going to be just fixing things that break, that's going to fundamentally change the way we age. Um, and, and, you know, we see this because there's more effort going into longevity, there's more money, there's more attention. And um, if you think about how we currently manage disease, that starts to break down if this magic comes. So, you know, in the United States, we live to about 77 years old. Yeah. And if I get heart disease at 72, that kind of sucks, but like, it's not that big of a deal, right? I'm gonna spend five years at the end of my life with heart disease and my doctor will manage me to that. And, and really like all of the data we have and all the studies we have are, are around humans as, as we live right now. Mm -hmm. So if I believe that I'm able to live confidently to 87 or 97, all of a sudden heart disease at 72, and that doesn't just kind of suck anymore. That's like a very significant problem. Yeah. And I'm going to spend 15 to 25 years at the end of my life disabled. So, you know, when I start to think about the root of some of these things that come with aging and heart disease is one of them, but there's diabetes, there's a, a whole set of others most of those things start to take root from decisions we've made in our 30s, 40s, and 50s. And if we don't get those things right now, when these magical things come later, technology-wise, we're not going to be really set to, to inherit them and take them on. Yeah, and I guess the thing is, is it's uh, it's the baseline, right? So we all know that really what we should be doing and um, having that coaching and guidance that your your platform offers is is what I call the kind of nudge factor, you know, because at the end of the day, you're constantly being nudged into thinking about your own personal health and well-being. And then obviously you have professionals that are working with your with your users to to help them on their way. So I guess you know how how does a proactive health partnership not just obviously extend the uh, the lifespan of people, but the quality of life in these later years. Yeah, I just I want to actually talk about your nudge factor for a second because this is one of my favorite things. Um, Phil, I assume you go to the dentist. I do. Yeah, you do, and and I assume you floss your teeth, right? Uh, I, I'm a a biblical flosser. Biblical flosser. I mean, that's good, right? Like, uh, there's a there's a really strong correlation between flossing and longevity, so. And, and I mean, it seems causative. So flossing is important. But if right. you talk to people about their flossing habits, almost everyone is going to floss their teeth that month before they go to the dentist. All right. And probably the month after. And then whether they floss the teeth for the remaining 10 months of the year, mm, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard. Some, some people don't. A lot of people don't. Um, but if you went to the dentist four times a year, you would probably be constantly flossing your teeth. And, and this has been something we've really noticed with our user base at LifeForce. Right. Um, so what we do is we engage customers with a clinician and an in-depth diagnostic four times a year. And what that means is no one gets out of the rhythm of these habits they're developing with us. And, um, and they, they have that nudge factor. So they're, they're flossing year round. Um, and so, so what does that mean in terms of health span? Um, something that I think everyone should be a little spooked about is this gap um, between kind of what I think of as like disease-free life expectancy and life expectancy, right? So, you know, I said earlier, we live to 77. There's an average 10-year gap 
during which we're diseased. So like 67 years old, all of a sudden something's got me and I'm in some way disabled that's, that's affecting my quality of life. And, and when you think about what that is, it's like a, a whole lost decade on average for Americans, right? That's like, if you just kind of paint that out across our population in the United States, it's 3.7 billion years of lost time, wow. right? And, and then you start to look at like, who does this happen to and why does it happen, right? So it, it's actually not evenly distributed. So people who are living to like 100 years old, 95 years old, these people actually have a smaller gap between their their disease-free life expectancy and their life expectancy, right? They're they're like living to say like 95 without disease and then dropping off at 97. So it seems to be something about what we're doing earlier that's kind of letting us have this small gap in time between when we we stop being disease-free and when we die. And um, so really like engaging early with your health, with someone who, who is going to do these nudges, who's going to keep you accountable and keep you going, um, not only increases your life expectancy, but also your, your disease-free life expectancy and, and shortens that gap. So you, you can imagine that by doing this well, you know, we're, we're not just recovering 3.7 billion years of life. We're, we're probably getting even more than that. Yeah, and I guess it's that uh, societal thing where obviously if we all live a, a more compressed morbidity period, then obviously healthcare systems will be more stable. Uh, even um, tax bases will be more stable because people are just going to be more active as, as they go forward, right? You know, yeah. and uh, I guess you know, obviously you're you know, cutting in. To, to riff on that for a second, um, yeah, yeah. So you know, in, in America, the spend on healthcare has outpaced inflation by two x since 1980, right? We've gone right. from 6% of our GDP spent on healthcare to over 20% of our GDP spent on healthcare. And like, you know, for starters, let's let's be real, that's extremely unsustainable. But like, what is driving this? Like what drives this, right? And it, it is that thing that we were talking about earlier. We've gone from 2000 centenarians to 90,000 centenarians, right? All of a sudden, because we're good at dealing with people getting sick, people get to be sick longer at the end of their lives because they live longer. And yeah. those people are very expensive to our healthcare system. So, you know, even economically, we have to get to this place where we start to intervene a little bit earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that. So, so what changes yeah. are happening in uh, in proactive health? You know, and, and why is it not? Why has it been more accessible now than it ever has been before? Yeah. So, so I like to kind of start by thinking about how our medical system evolves, and like a lot of these things that that happen are almost system problems. So. You know, I I had pneumonia in November. It, it kind of right. sucked, right? It was like an unpleasant experience. What recommend it to anyone? Um, but but really, it was an inconvenience for me, right? Like I went to the doctor, I got some antibiotics, um, took some painkillers, had cough medicine, all these things, right? And um, this thing that say a hundred years ago would have killed me, it kind of was bothersome for two weeks. So, you know that. We, I think we need to acknowledge that this like modern medical system we have is magical when it comes to getting sick. Um, and this is how it's evolved, right? It's evolved in this way where the economic incentives are around fixing people who are sick. So what that's meant is that we've trained the right number of doctors to fix sick, sick people. We've um, built up the insurance system to fix sick people. And the economic incentives aren't there around keeping people healthy. So there's this systemic problem and um, doctors, you, you know, they're, they're very highly paid humans, right? <laughs> doctors, doctors are well known for having high salaries, right? That's like yeah. everyone wants their kid to be a doctor. So um, it becomes really economically challenging to afford to engage with people are proactively. Because like to think about how you would do that, you have to sit down with them, you have to understand what's going on with their blood work, you have to understand what's going on with their lifestyle, what's going on with their sleep. And when you start to when you start to really put doctor costs against that, it's not very affordable. So there's always been this like group of doctors, you know, you, that if you were quite rich, you could afford to go find someone who is going to be very proactive about engaging in your health health with you. But if you're like me, you're like a, a guy who's got like a health plan. You get like mm-hmm. seven, 15 minutes a year, whatever, right? And um, what we start to see over the last couple of years is that technology is changing this sort of economic equation. 
So doctors don't have to be these people who are sifting through mountains of data to understand what's going on with my sleep, right? Technology can start to surface that. Or when I'm on, say, a call with a doctor or sitting in a doctor's office, they don't have to sit down and collate their notes to try and figure out what happened afterwards, right? They've got AI sort of assistants who are taking notes. And all of these tools are changing kind of the economics around engaging proactively with doctors. And, and this kind of enables companies like LifeForce to do what we're doing, right? We're taking this technology tools and we're making doctors superhuman, enabling them to engage with you proactively in a way that they just really never could before at a price point that normal people could afford. Right. So that, that that's really a new trend that's really accelerating quickly with with the advent of um, all of the AI tools that are that are continuing to emerge, yeah. And, and John, let's talk about the you know, the health information that's out there. It, obviously, yeah. it's it's abundant, right? And uh, oftentimes it's conflicting. So the important bit is this layer that you're offering, which is this partnering with a, a proactive uh, health expert. So you know, how do you find that that's working for your clients now? I mean, is that something that you've you brought in? At a, as a later date, or has it always been part of your package? And is this something that you're looking to scale now? What, what we found is that over the last couple of years, wellness and health products have proliferated, proliferated right? And there's a lot of very good ones, right? It, that's not to say that there's not a lot of good products, but there is a limited amount of focus that we have and a limited amount of resources. Yeah. I can't go buy all of the workout equipment and all of the sleep things, and I can't, I don't have time to figure out which things I need. Um, and figuring out how to navigate that ecosystem is is challenging, um, and this is kind of one of the insights that we had early when we we launched LifeForce. Um, is both myself and my co-founder had been had been navigating this ecosystem in different ways, and and personally, I, I was what you might call a health hobbyist. Like, you know, I was an obsessive glucose measurer. I had a finger prick monitor I carried around with me everywhere. Um, I did a lot of work on it, but when you think about how much time that took out of my life, it was a lot. And if I yeah. wanted to do what I was doing without it being a hobby, it would have been nearly impossible. Um, my co-founder, he he was not a health hobbyist, but had the same set of problems, was trying to figure out how to navigate this ecosystem. And he was just finding it prohibitive in terms of time. So we, we really realized that in order to bring this broadly to people, this way to approach health more proactively, we had to put together put together some way of navigating this ecosystem and for us, that meant putting experts with people and then empowering them with technology, like I said. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just your doctor that we put with you. We put a coach with you. And then that coach is versed in the healthy, in, a, in the health ecosystem, things that exist and, and works with our technology tools and our curriculum to guide you towards what you need um, and, and to guide you towards what you need, not just based on kind of how you're feeling, but based on a set of blood tests. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this kind of empirical approach to improving improving health is really important. Absolutely. And I guess, uh, Joel, before we wrap up, uh, what, we're now in 2024. What's, uh, what's ahead for LifeForce? Yeah, what's ahead for LifeForce? So um, <clears throat> I, I think people who, who are using LifeForce are going to find what we do in 2024 pretty magical. So we're bringing, we're bringing to market uh, LifeForce Health Score. Um, and it's going to be really one central place for you to understand your health. And this kind of comes down to this health navigation we were talking about. Like, yeah. it's very overwhelming to take in all of these data points that happen and understand, hey, how am I doing? And what do I need to focus on to make that better, right? So I'm not wearing it right now, but I'm an Aura Ring user, right? I, uh, I uh, do blood tests regularly. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, wear CGMs. Like, and how do I take that all and how do I put it together in one place and how do I understand what I need to work on? Um, so we're, we're, we're distilling that all into a score and then showing you the most important things you need to do to improve that. And I think that's going to be a, a, a big difference maker for people who want to engage in an easy way with their health. The second thing we're doing is we're really leaning in to empowering our doctors to work with you on more devices. Um, so an example of this is the, the single biggest modifiable risk factor that most people have in their lives is blood pressure. And your PCP really can't work with you on a consistent basis on blood pressure unless you're kind of in a really bad place on blood pressure. But, you know, back to this idea of like cardiovascular disease and where are you going to manage this to, you know, just okay 
is not okay if you want to live to 120 years old. Yeah. So we're we're putting um, blood pressure monitor or uh, blood pressure monitor devices um, into our program and having doctors work with you on a continuous basis with those devices. Same with aura rings around sleep, and same with same with smart scales, etc. And, and I think both of these things together are going to make Life Force kind of a pretty unique place to work with doctors on your longevity. Well, that sounds great, Joe. Well, uh, I always love talking to professionals in the space, and it's been uh, a real pleasure today. And uh, best of luck to you and your team in 2024. It's going to be good. Yeah, thanks, Phil.